to see you all here. I'm glad to be alive. Um, but no more truck stories. Uh, my name is Mitch Bring. I'm the coordinator for the workshop and uh, adjunct professor of architecture, kind of, at uh, this university at Buffalo. Um, Omar and I like looking at each other every now and then. We were astonished at how this workshop has grown. And we say, yeah, it went exactly according to plan. And those of you who know about happy coincidences know that's not true. Anyway, we were uh, early on, I guess it was 2016, Omar was attending a workshop a three-month wor workshop in Europe, EKWC, about ceramics. And uh, there's, a, I think it's Ensica, did I say it right? The National um, Ceramic Educators Conference. And it was an idea from the beginning. We bring ceramic artists, structural engineers and facade engineers as well as architects and academics together to explore the possibilities of what uh, architectural ceramics could do. And little did we know <laughs> how uh, amazing that journey would be, but it began literally in March of 2016 with an invitation Joshua Stein told us about a guy named Andy Brayman in uh, outside of Kansas City, technically Independence, Kansas, uh, Independence, Missouri. And um, it was an amazing visit because here was Boston Valley in a small version with one guy doing it all glazing, shaping, modeling, uh, building the CNC machines. I was impressed. In fact, I was astonished. And at that time, Andy Brayman was the only person working there, and he had built this f complete fabrication, uh, fabri not fabrication, uh, fabricatory. <laughs> anyway, he had built this shop, and he had lots of talented students who would come in and be honored to uh, uh, work for Andy because he's got a big reputation in the ceramic world. And eventually they lost that astonishment and asked to be paid. But um, Andy was doing everything by himself and he was programming robots and stuff to do it. And I saw sort of a, uh, there's a Yiddish word called yenta, which means uh, busybody or matchmaker. And I saw a great possible match between Boston Valley Terracotta and uh, Andy Brayman's Matter Factory. I said, wow, this is going to be terrific. Well, this year Andy was engaged as pretty much the R&D department of um, Boston Valley. And uh, hence the need to drive a truck, oh, no truck stories. We had to come bring all, most of the stuff from Kansas City. Now, a few things have changed in the time. Uh, Andy had a crew cut and clean shaven. <laughs> I had completely dark hair. <laughs> so it, it's taken a lot of energy to make this happen. And all of you know uh, that Andy hasn't slept for the past three months, uh, moved a cot into his studio because he had two desires. One was to fabricate the impossible things some of the people had suggested for their projects, and the other was to do them flawlessly. And in many ways, he succeeded. Uh, if anything, uh, he's learned to say no this time. And uh, he was very, very excited to do this and remain so despite the lack of sleep and having to ride with me telling bad jokes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Andy, one of Andy's great competencies is glazing. And we thought, I asked him to come up with a taxonomy of glazes that even architects could understand. Because last year we were getting for glaze suggestions pictures of dirt or pictures of uh, Ferrari bumpers and things like that. We needed a little bit more information. 
So Andy's going to walk us through that, and uh, please welcome him for all he's done, and uh, enjoy lunch. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you, everybody. Um, let's see. I'm just going to focus on uh, glazes today and kind of give an overview of how I see glazes in architecture and sort of a lot of the terminology or sort of classifications that could be useful in talking about stuff. Um, but first I'll start with a, uh, a kind of caveat about glaze, which is um, ceramics is, you know, clay itself is beautiful. Like so I was walking through the plant yesterday and there were these architectural pieces, these soffits I think, but out of red clay that were just like gorgeous sculptures. I mean, there is some of the historic work that's just incredible. So as much as I love glaze, I know it sort of has its place, in, you know, and, um, and it has a really long history. So much has been done with glaze, you know. The first glazes were probably 10,000 years ago. Egypt, the, what's called like an Egyptian paste glaze. Um, and really from that point to now, there continues to be lots of development. And so history is a, is a great source um, to look at what's possible. And, and then there's a lot of new kind of innovation that's happening as well. We can, we can kind of talk to that. Um, the other thing I wanted, wanted to say before I dive right into glazes is my, well, excitement to be here, to be working with Boston Valley, you know, it's, I, on one level, I think what we're doing here is really decadent, you know? Everybody has incredibly busy schedules. There's so, you know, we're taking time out, all the resources, everything. It's, it's, uh, it's a rare kind of situation, uh, and it's, it's great to be a part of it. Um, as, a, as a sort of student of history and ceramic history, one of the, um, companies or people that I really have been interested in uh, for a long time now is Guastavino, Rafael Guastavino, which uh, many of you know the work, right, of the sort of Beaux Arts style uh, cotillion arches. And um, his company and what he did I think was really amazing. There's a great uh, book that came out maybe 10 years ago by uh, John Ossendorf, I think is his name. But it's this I got the book, I tore through the book, and I thought, God, what an amazing company, this uh, Guastavino, and what he did. And, and I can't help think about sort of Boston Valley through that lens, and sort of what Boston Va where Boston Valley is compared to sort of, say, Guastavino. And Guastavino never sort of put on things like ACAW, where he'd bring in architects and sort of have a kind of R&D and innovation sort of incubator happening and I wonder what it would have been like if, if that was possible but um, I did have an epiphany a couple months ago that that Boston Valley is a, is a more amazing company than Guastavino and there are a lot of sort of examples of that sort of both just the historical work that they're doing but then the new construction of course where is where my excitement is and everyone here probably as well and um, I think that it really is a moment where you can recognize there are other companies that do this, but there aren't very many. And Boston Valley, because of some just circumstances and, and mostly probably certain people, uh, it's positioned so well to really change ceramics and architecture. And I think it's we're watching it happen, and you guys are really uh, the reason why it's happening. So, okay. Now we'll talk about glazes. Um, so my background is in the studio uh, ceramics, and so artists are sort of trained to break the rules. You know, we're, we're sort of really taught that it's, a, it's advantageous to do things differently in the studio. And so that's great. You can stumble on all sorts of things and uh, discoveries, um, but you can also set up scenarios that are really great for production too. And so with, um, there's a kind of theme with some of the 
discussion about glaze, which is control, right? Like how much control can be exerted over the material? And um, I can just speak from sort of my own work in the sense that when, uh, which is sort of digitally driven usually, and um, goes through a sort of similar workflow that a lot of the work for say this conference went through, um, is that usually when it loosens up in the process, the material sort of misbehaves a little, or the gla you know something softens in that transition. Usually, it's better, you know, in my case, to my eyes, and I think that that's something that this group uh, it may not apply entirely to everybody, but uh, that the idea of kind of learning this thing that people in say the studio uh, practice. Uh, area learn very quickly, which is you have to be incredibly flexible with what you get, what you get out of the kiln, and how much uh, control you have, and how much control can be too much. Um, so, in terms of the actual uh, ways of kind of breaking down what glazes are, I mean, I sort of. You know, these are the basic categories of color, glaze finish, variegation, and opacity. Variegation being sort of a term that's used in botany often to describe um, sort of how plants are colored too. There's a whole sort of set of terminology for describing organic uh, growth and matter that sort of maps in a decent way onto glazes because the alternative is sort of well, there isn't one. Artists sort of use all kinds of poetic terms or just sort of terms that are handed down, and it's a kind of difficult realm to sort of describe in kind of any, any real concrete way, unless you really know the other person and you're sitting in front of samples and you know what you're talking about. So the task that um, Mitch gave me was sort of like, how do we sort of make that discussion a little easier? And with color, it's fairly easy. I mean, we have literally their tools, their scanners, there's different methodologies, uh, like Pantone to LAB color systems, all that same with gloss or glaze finish and opacity. Those things are all measurable. We can quantify them very easily. Where it gets tricky is where you start to talk about variation or variegation within a glaze. So this is just a little diagram of the, those different categories kind of broken out. And this is really um, focused in terms of architecture. And there are other areas, you know, that may, and especially in terms of variegation, there are glazes that are very fragile or sharp or, you know, um, less durable that sort of aren't included in this system. So we'll focus on these categories. And these are just categories that I sort of culled from looking at what was sort of, what were the terms that would be needed? How can we sort of condense things in a way to just use them to talk about um, glazes? And so you won't find this in sort of textbooks or things. And, and other artists would sort of understand, probably, uh, pretty quickly what you're getting at. But it's really just, um, a starting point. So we'll start through, and the, the glaze samples um, are from Boston Valley that are pictured here. And you'll see like a little penny there to give you a sense of scale, right? And I've said, you know, over and over how my background really is as an artist. And for years, I really was a potter and I would make domestic or objects for a domestic space. And really, the, the distance there is about, you know, from your lips to about the, your arm for pottery. That's about the distance that you exist most of the time with it and maybe across the room. And so for architecture, it's a completely different game. You, you've got, um, it has to look good from three blocks away, you know, or, or further. And then it also has to be beautiful or communicate what you want it to communicate as you're passing through an entrance way and you may be able to touch it. So. That problem of sort of distance is one that um, artists typically don't have to sort of deal with. Um, and so for a while now, I've really been working on 
that. And Boston Valley, of course, has been working on that from the get-go. And um, I will correct Mitch just briefly in terms of the R&D stuff. Like, I'm sort of a wing of their existing R&D stuff. And I've learned so much over the past, you know, especially the past two months through working with Nat and their Glaze team. And um, so much of what they've already got going is, is um, pretty incredible. So, okay, so floating glazes, that would be, you know, I mean, you can read the description, I don't have to read it to you, but um, this type of phenomenon is one where, and all the phenomenons that I'm describing from now on are where you want the surface to be broken up. You want it there to be uh, variegation on the surface. And one reason you might want that, and I find that lots of architects are sort of attracted to that, is because it puts it in um, contrast to other materials like painted aluminum or stainless steel or what, you know, materials that can be incredibly flat and um, have a very consistent, smooth surface, right? Um, it may be something that you, you want, but if you're interested in sort of exploiting and sort of demonstrating that what the material is, then sometimes a, a variegated glaze might be a way to do that. So <clears throat> since I know that a lot of people in this room are, uh, are often shepherding designs through the process and budgets become <clears throat> an issue uh, that really needs to have an effect on the design process, I'll t try and talk to some of that. Um, because sometimes it's easy to just get lost in the glaze and then later you figure out, oh, it takes two firings to achieve this, which then increases the cost maybe a lot, right? Or it increases the chances of uh, variation among panels at, over the course of manufacturing. So floating glazes, often are two glazes that melt differently applied on top of each other. They don't have to be, but that's often sort of the case. Okay, and so here are some different sort of examples of, that, of those. And many of the examples ha share other qualities, like the figure on the top left, you can see it's breaking on the edges of that texture, right? And when you really work with glaze a lot, I mean, early on you figure out that the, what you're putting it on can have a huge effect on it. Whether the surface is flat, whether it's vertical, whether there's texture, it can have wildly different impacts on how the glaze melts and how it moves and what it looks like in the end. And so lots of artists really capitalize on that. And they'll know the glaze they're gonna use, they make the form. You know, for beginning people in ceramics, if you walk into any like ceramics 101 class, there's the bisque wear. There's like a shelf that's not glazed. And it's usually full because the people make the thing, it looks so good when it's wet. This sort of leather hard state, it looks so nice. It's like the way light hits it, it's beautiful. And then it, it maybe gets fired once without any glaze, and it's this sort of chalky, stone, pebbly, sometimes it's pinkish. And then people are like, what, what glaze do I put on it? And then it just sits there sometimes for months just because you don't know how to get that next step. So there's, there can be a real good argument for sort of doing glaze research earlier in the process to sort of clarify what the design is, right? So starting with a glaze rather than trying to come up with a glaze in the end. It's not always possible or realistic, but there's, I think, a good reason to approach things that way sometimes. Okay, so the breaking glaze. I think we all know sort of what that is just from being through the plant, being, having other jobs happen that uh, had glazes that broke on the edges. And it's really, um, usually a function of fluidity of the glaze, where the glaze goes into the melt, the glaze moves on the geometry of the piece, and then it gets thinner on an edge. Uh, in the most basic example, like in these two examples, it's just exposing sort of the clay body underneath with a kind of clearish, glossy edge. 
Sometimes it can have more dramatic effects. You could have uh, a different color there where it breaks on the edge. Um, but usually it's, it's something like along these lines where it's sort of pooling uh, and, uh, and flowing and breaking on an edge. So depending on the surface geometry, this is where you get into the details where you know, if, a gla if an edge on the prototype is rounded versus sharp, um, you may get a really different line. Uh, and sometimes that can be, depending on how important that edge is, it may need to be considered in the design process for how the mold is going to last or wear or something like that. So, okay, luster glazes. And these are, uh, I don't use a lot of glazes that work within this realm of sort of uh, firing up to temperature. In the case of Boston Valley, that would be like for people, ceramic people in here, cone three, cone four. Um, and there's a smaller subset of glazes that will provide a kind of luster like finish. And it's typically uh, lots of metal in the glaze, you know, uh, manganese being um, a real basic version. Um, if you think of sort of Wedgwood or Royal Dalton or something, or some luster on a piece, typically that is a lower temperature uh, application. And I know Boston Valley's done jobs that have that. It's usually an additional firing that's lower than the firing of the regular glaze. And there is a whole subset of uh, lusters that are available that um, could be palladium or gold, and um, they actually are palladium and gold, and so they're expensive typically, and they're put on through uh, spray application generally. They're usually not as robust as um, like the glazes here, which are fired up to maturity. And then I know in the recent years, like the team here at UB had um, done research on sort of iridescence and looking at glazes that fall into that sort of category and had some real successes there with um, kind of narrowing in on glazes that have that effect. And this is where we get back to the question of control, right? So you can find glazes that will do things and then they may be very difficult to replicate. And it wouldn't be because, say, Boston Valley doesn't know what they're doing. It's because the, the variables are so sensitive, you know, that application of thickness of glaze being one of the most prime culprits of variation uh, in the process. So how much glaze, you might have a glaze that gets, is iridescent if you have it just the right thickness. You go thicker, it's gone. You go thinner, it's, you know, looks like dog shit or, you know, whatever. I mean, you, there's, uh, you can find yourself in a realm that's not desirable, right? Where you just have this sliver of um, achieving what you saw on the sample. And so what Boston Valley does is they try and figure out if that's the scenario before it goes too far, right? Like this is too finicky of a glaze base to use. Let's not really pursue this, it's much too sensitive. And um, they're doing some research in terms of how to uh, kind of make some of these uh, processes a little more robust. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Okay, so rivulet glaze. For people in ceramics, a rivulet glaze people would think of like an ash glaze, a glaze that's made primarily from ash from wood which has uh, lots of calcium in it and will cause a kind of stream-like effect. Um, but you also see that on a kind of micro level on some glazes where they have these sort of little streams. And the phenomenon in terms of uh, chemically what's happening, Bill Cardi could talk to this, but it's, it's really not related. <coughs> and there's sort of a macro rivulet and a micro rivulet. <coughs> And well, let me just go back to this. So the rivulet glazes would be particularly susceptible to what plane they are on and gravity. 
on the surface of an object. So it's something I've, I've talked to other people about here where I think there could be some research, I don't know how, um, how fruitful it would be, but I think there could be some research with sort of using some of the tools for landscape architecture, of sort of uh, drainage scripts and things like that with a model to kind of be able to predict and see where you would get different effects based on gravity, right? Because it's already the tool sets there, you could sort of map that to a mesh model fairly easily and, and do some things. Now, would that ultimately be useful or would it just be sort of exercise to display digital prowess? Maybe, probably, but it could be that it would be useful. If anything, you would understand the glaze really well after going through that process and sort of seeing where the digital uh, predicted and what really happened. <clears throat> but once again, if, if I think of that exercise to, to do that, the main thing to then keep an eye on would be the thickness of the glaze. So you could design this whole test that sounds so great, but if you had two different people glazing it, different parts, you would get wildly different results probably. And um, so pooling glazes, this is you know very similar to, I mean some glazes might break on edges but they don't pool, okay? Probably all pooling glazes break on edges. And there's a limit to how much you want things to pool, you know? If you get, you know, a half an inch of glaze pooled onto ceramic, that's probably not good, right? The ceramic will, won't fail and be falling off the building, but the glaze itself, if you get up into sort of that inch thick, that's too much, I could say, you know, confidently. Okay, crackle glazes. So I lumped two completely different uh, examples here. They both are sort of visually, they're both crackling, right? They have nothing really to do with each other in terms of um, why they're happening. The one on the left, you can sort of barely see. So if you don't want that, it's called crazing. And if you do want it, it's called a crackle. So that's the kind of basic difference. Um, in terms of for Boston Valley, their clay body is uh, tuned in to survive freeze thaw. And so if there's a crackle pattern on the glaze, it's nothing to worry about or concern yourself about. It does not mean that the crackle is happening because there's structural flaws in the body itself. I think it's a reason, if you don't understand ceramics, it's a reasonable question. Thankfully, the answer is, is not a problem. You know, underneath, you know, because there's a, the way it works, and Bill and I could tag team this lecture probably, uh, but there's a body glaze interface. There's the area right between the two. Uh, that sort of is a mix of both the clay body and the glaze. And then you go a little bit further than that, and the clay body is no, doesn't really know about the glaze happening up above. I mean, it's under compression, but um, that's a long-winded explanation to say, don't worry about crackling on glazing, on, on glazes. Now, the one on the right, is one that you don't see as often, but there have been different times in studio ceramics where that becomes sort of in vogue to some extent, and it's using a particular material um, that shrinks a lot and pulls away, but also has another uh, material that sticks it to the surface. So it's sort of the dry uh, riverbed effect. And it can be controlled to sort of what extent. If it cracks too much, you could have it actually cracking off the piece. But it, it's something that's super tactile. You could glaze over the top of that again. I mean, there's sort of no end to this. I mean, you guys get the, the idea here is that it's this super you know, deep area of research that you could just go on and on and on and on and on just for glazing. So um, the point is for individual projects, sort of how to get the glaze to fit the clay and the site and whatever it is that are your main parameters um, and then build on that for other, other projects. 
And um, as, as people who, who know so much about architecture and especially sort of older buildings, you'll know if you see an older terracotta building in Manhattan that you can see the crackle effect on the surface. And it's often sort of the pollution that sort of gets into that surface and causes it to uh, darken along those lines. And um, there's, there probably are ways to clean it, but you know, typically that's just the way it is and that's the way it stays. Some people love it so much that they'll actually stain the work right after the crackle. And I think Boston Valley's done this for clients before where it'll come out, it'll crackle, and you can stain it with a pigment that'll go in and stay there and sort of like speed that process up and amplify the look of, um, of that crackle. Okay, so tea dust glaze. I thought it would, that's actual term that people in ceramics use to describe a classification of, of glazes that have these teeny little crystals, right? And um, there are lots of glazes in ceramics that have this where there's tiny crystal growth um, at some point on the glaze. And if it happens in a large amount, it can be a, a field of them, so it actually changes the surface quality. So it becomes sort of a matte uh, or satin surface. And if you were to look at it under a, a microscope, you would see that it's actually crystal growth. Um, and I say there, you know, the color of the background may be different than the color of the crystal. So these type of glazes are going to be less reliable than a flat, glossy black. I mean, they just are, because we're talking about the growth of a crystal, uh, which is dependent on the cooling cycle, so maybe where it is in the kiln. So stuff in the bottom right might not be cooling the same. Well, it won't be cooling the same as the stuff at the top you know, and so some glazes that might look incredible on a four by four inch tile, when you scale up, you see, oh, wait a second, we're not getting the same surface everywhere. Why are we not getting the same surface everywhere? They're not being careful enough. It's not that simple. It's, it's more like you may be walking into, or treading into territory that has um, variables that are difficult to control. So. Usually, that's try. You know, there are things that just you think you uh, understand fully, but until you go into complete production, that it, it doesn't. You know, you don't know. Okay. The one of the nice things with these tea dust glazes is that they can be fairly fluid too. So um, they can flow on a form, they can break on edges sometimes. The crystal growth will ha can happen based on the geometry. So you can have the form really start to affect the glaze. Okay, modeled glazes. Uh, it's what it sounds like. It's glazes that look sort of, you know, like it's just not flat. There aren't streaking necessarily and it's kind of, you know, splotchy probably not the greatest term to describe it, but uh, if it doesn't work, maybe that's the right term. But um, you see it in the, a lot of the historical restoration work that Boston Valley does where they're sort of uh, imitating people who were imitating marble, right? So there were ceramic pieces that were made 100 years ago to look like marble that then you need to get replaced. And so a kind of modeled glaze surface where it's maybe a couple glazes sprinkled or splattered on top of another glaze to get it to be modeled. Now, so that's one way of doing it. And it's a way that you can actually then kind of control fairly well. Um, another is to have a single glaze that becomes modeled in, its, uh, in the way it melts. Um, so some of these are used, like the bottom middle one, the red one, um, that would have a kind of granular uh, ingredient applied to the glaze with the glaze mixed in it, and it would be a granular piece that would then melt in the firing, and that's why you're getting a modeled thing. So that point is sort of seeded uh, and would be visible prior to firing as a little speck. Okay, and then the last couple glazes I have are just uh, glazes that um, were test 
uh, based on some of the work for uh, the workshop. And this is a close up of uh, the, one of the profiles that uh, KPF was using. And it just has a, uh, a white glaze that has a green sort of speckle on it. So in this, to me, um, well, the tile's right there. So this is gets to the scale issue, right? I mean, I think it's beautiful right here, you know. But then from across the street, you, you've got to rely on shadow and other things, not necessarily just the glaze itself to sort of carry uh, the surface. And, um, but the thing that's interesting about that particular glaze is it's one glaze and it's put on uh, a once fire application. So that means it's not you know, as expensive to sort of do and it could still sort of fit within a larger project perhaps. And then, of course, with all of these glazes, the way people who test glazes typically work is there's the base glaze. That's how we refer to it. There's like the basic recipe. And then there's colorants that get added on top of that and other little things. And so that's where when a glaze gets tweaked or researched is you're basically trying to keep the base the same and then add or change colorants or add or change things that might change fluidity. So usually you kind of narrow in on a base that has a certain trait and then sort of tweak it from there. But All right, well, um, I think that uh, that kind of covers my, the basic overview. And if people have uh, questions in, in the broad sense or in the specific sense, I'm willing to give it a shot, so. If you have questions, I need to run this around to, to have you on mic. Okay. That's one question. Oh, good. There it was. Okay. Hi. For the yeah. metallic glazing, have you ever done anything using uh, copper or gold or silver within those glazes to make them capacitive? or to be reactive in some way to use with electronics? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, okay, I can, I can say more than that, which is, um, yeah, a couple, I like to work with electronics, and so a couple of years ago I started, I knew of other artists who had done some things in the past with running electricity through luster, and, um, so that sent me down that path. And um, yeah, I have plenty of information to share with you there. My background really um, from 10 or so years ago is I did a lot of printing uh, with ceramic inks um, for b digitally printing two-dimensional, uh, what are called decals and silk screening and transferring that onto ceramic objects. And I did that for other, other people and my own work. And that process is very similar to sort of early uh, electronics and uh, stuff from the 50s that was done to make transistors. Uh, so there's a relationship between ceramic printing for decals and logos and early electronics that's established. So, yeah. There are some commercial techniques. That's cool. And there's and they're mostly lower temperature, I think. It can be those signals are stable though, so they can handle the high temperature. Yeah. But they're often dark. They're not white. Right. But ceram yeah, ceramics as a material, I mean, let's just say it, it's amazing. It's incredible. It can be it can conduct electricity, it could be used to do the opposite, you know. And it, and it is, you know, I mean, most, there's a ton of ceramics in this right, you know, my phone. So, yay ceramics. <laughs> are there any colors that are especially hard to achieve? I'm so glad you asked that question. Yes, there are. Uh, and I hope someone proves me wrong here, but what, 
I would say are really difficult if you just ask me or another person in ceramics say okay neon colors you know are difficult to get you know super bright hot pink is hard to get um, what else Jason what, what Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some, like, you, yeah, uranium orange, right? <laughs> like, there's, there are colors that exist that aren't really viable today um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. And, you know, uh, yeah, Fiesta wear orange, you're kind of out of luck, you know, on that for um, the early orange, the later one's fine. A quick question. Um, so there's this piece of terracotta that we were using on one of our projects that have these sort of plateaus and divots in it, and we did a single fire glaze on it. And when you look closely, you start seeing these little dimples mm -hmm. within it. Could you sort of explain what those are? Okay. So they're probably pinholes. Um, and so there's a whole... I could have given this talk just on flaws of ceramics. <laughs> but that's kind of a downer. So the, uh, and actually is worth noting that sometimes the flaws are also sort of um, the feature as the expression is, right? So pinholing, there's a whole class of glazes, Shino glazes that rely on pinholing to be what they are and they can be beautiful. But in your case, that's pro I'm guessing that's not the um, consensus. And so pinholes can come from all different things. And usually there can be a difficult sort of thing to trace back to why it's happening. And so like on the shop models, there's pinholing on the clear glaze. On, for those of you who have seen that model, it's, uh, it's a blue gradient to a clear glaze, and there's lots of pinholing on the clear. And um, you know, from far away, it's not a problem. But when you get up close, it is. It's an issue. And so that particular glaze, I think, uh, well, we fired one batch, and it had all that pinholing. I thought, oh, fuck. I, OK, I know what to do. I made the changes, and then got rid of probably 80% of the pinholing that was happening. There's still 20%. So then it's a question of, sort of talking to people like Bill Cardi and saying, okay, what do you think we should do? You know, this is what we've done. Uh, how do we trace back to figure out what that's coming from? And then it kind of does go back to the issue of control. You know, at some point it's like if you have a huge panel and there's a couple little pinholes, when when is it sort of like you have to accept the nature of of what the material is and what you're working with. And I know that you guys all have to do that on all your jobs. You're, ex you know, you're having to kind of figure out where it's tolerable and where it's an issue, what you really fight for and what you don't. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm on the side that has to kind of help make it perfect. So, of course, I, I love a little more flexibility, right? Um, but. That's something with the, I think the longer you work with the material, the more you, the more you either just are beaten down by it and you just accept the fact that like, you just can't control this to the extent that maybe some other materials are controllable. Or if you want to, you just really pigeonhole yourself into a very conservative set of choices. I mean, that's the alternative. If you want, like, you want every piece to come out dead on, then you're just going to get pushed into an area that's very narrow. So. So, Andy, ceramics are alluring in part to, let's call it, to their liveliness. Yeah. Um, but how, as an architect, do I specify that effectively? How do I communicate design intent to the manufacturer? Well, I think that's one of the things that uh, Mitch asked me to try and put together some sort of terminology so we could discuss like what traits you might be looking for in a glaze. So in 
in your team's case, you wanted something that would pool and or break on the edges of the geometry. So you would really see the sort of contrast of, of the of the tooling pattern or the form anyways. And um, and we did that, right? That that worked out great in the sense of really being able to define that edge well, uh, knowing what gla that a fluid glaze was going to go on there. And uh, we got sort of lucky in the sense that the glaze, if you turn over the versions that you got, you'll see where the glaze is coming close to the shelf, right? And for people who really don't know that much about ceramics, there's something I should have said where when you fire the thing, you have to really have an area that's not glazed. You know, so typically the, the glaze comes down to the edge of the piece and then it doesn't go any further. And if it does go further, it may be a minor flaw or it may destroy the piece entirely. So if you had a bigger piece and, um, um, and it, the glaze ran and stuck on two opposing ends and then it fused, and then the kiln cools and it's still shrinking and contracting, you break the piece right in half because you've glued it down on two opposing ends. So if it only stuck on one part, it would kind of shrink, you know, and be okay. So, you know, we got lucky. It, it didn't really stick in two places like that. But your question about com how to communicate the design intent, I think it's, you know, it's still just wading through I mean, the hardest thing about that is, I think, from the outside looking into your position, would be you, you, the more information you have, the more you can kind of decide what you want. Like when you're starting out working with the material, it's hard to know what you want because you're not familiar with what are all the options. You know, and if you go through the glaze lab at Boston Valley, it's sort of overwhelming. I mean, there's just thousands of samples everywhere. So you have to be able to sort of give them enough information that they can kind of pull from the collection. Um, and there's a kind of, there's a certain safety of pulling from their existing collection because they've already kind of know a lot of the surprises that those glazes offered up and they've sort of tweaked them and tuned them. Um, but then some, some projects maybe demand a, a, new, a, a new glaze that ventures into other territory. And some projects can allow for that. Either the budget or the lead time or whatever it is might allow for that kind of thing. So, so maybe with Terracotta we say not a specification, but a dialogue. Yeah, I think so. Because there's know, these are hard to quantify, like rivulet, you know. Do, do you, how do you quantify that? I mean, you could come up with some sort of method or a methodology, I suppose, but yeah, Eric. Yeah. Um, it was on. There we go. I think it was Misha was telling uh, telling us yesterday about uh, how um, some of the glazes that Christine had come up with were a electric kiln, and those are really hard to with a traditional, you know, I guess fi fired kiln. So. Can you speak to the limitations of different sort of kiln types and how that affects the glaze? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So at, at Boston Valley, they use intermittent kilns, right? Kilns that go up and come down as opposed to a tunnel kiln where it goes straight through and the kiln's on all the time and you have to sort of feed that beast, right? So there's other manufacturers that would use that system, right? And um, to me, the intermittent is really a, a sweet spot to be working in because you have more flexibility and you can do things that would be difficult to do in a tunnel kiln environment. Um, but for my relationship with Boston Valley, and I'm sort of tasked with, you know, now that they cause, you know, in, uh, we're not even halfway, but we're close. You know, next week, 
it's over for me. So I'm going to be working on um, glaze development, specifically variegation glazes. And the only way that that really made sense in my mind and also in um, the people at Boston Valley is if I have a similar kiln set up. So I have the, the same style kiln. It's a little bigger than the lab kiln in their um, glaze department so that it could do prototyping or small production when that makes sense but it's uh, the same brand and same everything. So the technicians who work on the big kilns at Boston Valley came to Kansas City, set it up, and so then it's apples to apples, as close as, as, as you could, um, which is great because then if I develop and test something there and I see that it's robust enough to pursue, meaning it's not so finicky that if you get it slightly off, it's a different glaze, um, that if it kind of fits those parameters, then it could scale up in, in their kilns pretty seamlessly, right? And that's super important because otherwise, you, you, if you go through all the testing with one kiln and you're sharing it with clients and they sort of think, this is what we're talking about, and then, it's a, all of this energy to kind of match this, this thing that may or may not be attainable. That, that's an issue, so. And so this does speak to if you found ceramic out in the world and you're like, this is what we want, um, that could be very easy to replicate or it could be very hard. And it all just depends on the specifics of what that sample is. Some samples are like, yeah, no problem. You know, some, they would just be able to use an existing glaze and match it right away. And some stuff is, you know, more exotic or more difficult to really say with confidence, yes. And so there'd have to be testing. And the thing with the testing, for people who don't understand the timeline, it's like you make the tests, let's say you mix up the test in a day, and, and you put it in a kiln, and then you wait three days, basically. And then you get the sample out. And then if you need to do another version, you have to do that over again. And you can condense it and do things quicker, but then you're messing with everything. So you might get a result that really only works in fast cooling, which you're not going to be doing on a production level. So the lead time, and that's if, if, if the person dropped everything and just made the test that day, stuck it in a kiln that day. And it gets even a little more complicated, and the kiln shouldn't be empty. It should have a load that's similar to what it would have in production. Now, all the kilns that we're talking about here would be computer controlled. So there's a ramp that fires it up a certain way and controls the cooling down, controls the pressure inside, and all that stuff is data logged and you know charted as best as possible. But it is still sometimes a certain class of glazes can be dependent on how heavy the load is. 